Can you hear me? Okay, that's fine. Um, first thing I started with was a picture of Ahmad Lutfi Said. Uh, I myself and, and other liberals in Egypt, we consider ourselves the gun. Okay, how can I do it? Okay, I, I think it's fine. Okay. Uh, one century, or not, nearly 90 years ago, Ahmad Lutfi Said, uh, the first director of the Cairo University and, and the, uh, the founder of Egyptian recent liberalism, he came to Israel to the Hebrew University in, in Jerusalem and he participated in the opening ceremony of, of the university. Uh, I, I picked his picture to show how deep the relation between our countries. It started maybe a century ago and, and it lasted through, through lots of actors from both sides, through, through Ali Salem's trips to, to Israel, through Nagib Mahfouz and, and Amin al-Mahdi's writings for peace until maybe the, the Egyptian firemen who, who uh, came to Israel to, to fight together with Israeli firemen in Haifa and Carmel against the fire in 2010 and, and maybe until today. Uh, usually there is untold story. We, we don't know about it. It happens, we don't see about it. And, and that's why I'm here. That's why uh, I believe that we, there's something needed to be done because there is some part of the story we usually are missing. Uh, I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Michael Nabil and I started, uh, I'm an Egyptian blogger and activist. I started in 2005, uh, late 2005. Uh, in the beginning, my, uh, my focus was around liberalism and democracy and human rights. I wrote lots of times for religious rights and for minority rights. Uh, in 2009, I decided to start a new movement in Egypt under the name No for Compulsory Military Service. At the time, it was the first anti-militarist and first pacifist and the first peace movement in, in the history of Egypt. Uh, we adapt the, the wide understanding of anti-militarism and peace and using uh, and disarmament and demilitarization and the, the use of non-violent tools to, to solve conflicts. Uh, we chose the name No for Compulsory Military Service because we have in Egypt now around 2 million recruits in the army and, and Egypt haven't been in war for the last 40 years nearly. And, and it's, it's a waste of effort. They are not treated as human beings. And, and we, it's a big number, two million. It's more than the inhabitants of Gaza or, or Palestinians in Israel or, or, or settlers in West Bank. It's, it's a huge number of people. And, and it's a huge or a bad human rights situation, which we, we believe it, it can be our priority. Uh, in 2010, I, I was requested to serve in the Egyptian army as an officer. Uh, and I refused to, to serve in, in the army because of my pacifist beliefs. Uh, it was a situation because the Egyptian uh, law doesn't recognize the right of conscientious objection to the military service. Uh, so I, I published a statement saying that I wouldn't serve in, in the Egyptian army and I bear the consequences. I acknowledge that I, I understand that I can lose my freedom because of refusing to serve in the army, because of refusing to carry arms or, or to be part of any military or paramilitary entity. Uh, in, in first, because of my pacifist beliefs, and, and second, because I didn't want to be part of any conflict in the Middle East, not to be used by any general uh, uh, for political interests. In my, in, in my statement, I stated that I'm not ready to, to carry an arm against an Israeli soldier carrying or defend compulsory recruited and defending the right of his country to exist. Uh, three weeks later, after uh, publishing my statements, the uh, military police arrested me from my house or kidnapped me from my house. Uh, and the next day, I was exempt from the military service on the basis of having uh, acute psychological disorders, which uh, the, doesn't allow me from serving in the army. Uh, that was just two or three months before the revolution. Uh, at, at that time, I needed to clarify myself and clarify uh, uh, and to clarify my, my position, why I refused to serve in the army. Some, some, so I made some media interview. At the time, uh, Ynet or uh, Yadot Ahranot contacted me and, and I made an interview with them. And, and that was a very uh, important thing, 
happened because usually Israeli media shows a negative part of the picture or, or, or they see usually risks more than opportunities and it's very rare to cover about the Middle Eastern peace communities. And, and that was a step forward and, and in, in this uh, article or in this interview I used first time the term Brew Israel. Um, and, and, and then I, I wrote an article to clarify wh what I meant when I used pro Israel as a term, like other terms like feminist or, or, or Zionist or, or lots of other terms have very wide uh, uh, meanings or different meanings and there's lots of diversities between these uh, meanings. So I, I had to write another article later. Uh, I called it why I'm a pro Israel, and I, I said that yes, I, I disagree with lots of policies of the state of Israel, but I, I acknowledge that Israel uh, um, have high standards of free periodical election and high standards of, of human rights in comparison with other uh, Middle Eastern and North, North African countries. And, and for my surprise, then the Israeli Foreign Ministry contacted me later and, and they wanted to publish it on the Arabic blog of the Foreign Ministry of the Israeli Foreign Ministry. Uh, and and uh, it wasn't a problem for me and it was published and here's a picture of it. Um, I wasn't at the time, until I refused to serve in the military, I wasn't allowed to travel out of Egypt as most of, of Egyptian students are not allowed to travel in the last years of their uh, university until they finish their, their military service. And, and so for since 2006, I wasn't allowed to leave Egypt because of this military issue. Uh, so when I was exempt on the military service, that was an opportunity. I said, okay, I, 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 I should use this chance and travel out of the country. At the time, I contacted the, the Israeli embassy in Cairo, uh, and, and I was surprised by their reaction because they, they didn't even allow me to visit them in the embassy. They, they, they refused to cooperate with me in giving a visa, and I felt very bad for being pushed away by the embassy. Uh, and, and that was before the revolution and continued after the revolution. And I started to realize another fact that how the, the Israeli authorities are somehow keeping all the relation with the Egyptian government and how they are not trying to approach or even refusing to approach independent actors or even uh, uh, opposition political parties in Egypt. Uh, one month later, uh, a new thing happened in the Middle East when, when Tunisians succeeded through protests and through nonviolent tools to through their, throughout their dictator Ben Ali. And, and uh, the success of the Tunisian revolution triggered lots of other revolutions in the Middle East. The, the whole argument of dictatorships is that dictatorships are strong and, and, and you can't fight them, especially if, if you are in, in a peaceful or a nonviolent revolution. But when, when Tunisians made it, that convinced other people in the Middle East to say, if, if Tunisians can do it, then we can do it, why not? Uh, so for, for long years, we were acting for democracy and freedom in Egypt, and usually the reaction of society have been very few, very few people joining us. But, but after the, the Tunisian revolution, for surprise, we found tens of thousands since the beginning, and then, then millions of people demonstrating and, and going on the street and facing the police forces and even later facing the military, calling for freedom and for democracy. It, 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 it was a huge surprise, no one expected it, and, and, and it moved not only Egypt, but the whole area forward. Usually I divide the, the Egyptian revolution into three main phases. Uh, the phase one, it was the first 18 days of the revolution, it was against the dictator. Mubarak, he lasted in power for 30 years. He was supported nearly by everyone, like, like most of the dictators. Uh, and even he was working to, to, to make it easier for his son, Gamal Mubarak, to reach power, to be the next president. Uh, in, in 18 days, we succeeded to throw out the dictator, to get rid of the dictator. Uh, a few weeks later, after, after Mubarak left power, I wrote my article, which Hillel mentioned, uh, and, and I said the revolution managed until now to get rid of the dictator, but not the dictatorship. And, and I, myself, and my friends, we were working against replacing the dictatorship with a democracy, with democratic institutions. And then the military took power, the military council, and the man who's leading the country, uh, Tantawi, the picture in the middle, he was the Minister of Defense of Mubarak for 20 years, and before that he was uh, the leader of the uh, Presidential Guard of Mubarak, so he was 
someone from inside the regime. He was very faithful to the regime. And, and I was one of the early voices who stood against the military dictatorship and, and tried to, to write against the violations of the military dictatorship. After, after 17 months of fighting the, the military uh, council in Egypt, we moved forward to the third phase of the dictatorship or, or for the revolution uh, in which we are fighting the religious uh, uh, Islamic dictatorship. After the military made a deal with, with Islamists and delivered power to Islamists through unfree and undemocratic election, we are now still continued through nonviolent ways fighting the, the authoritarian regime uh, which exists in, now in Egypt and which is resembled by the name of, of the President Mohamed Morsi. Uh, as I mentioned, the first phase was against Mubarak. It was started with few hundreds, a few tens of thousands, and then, then became millions. It's estimated that during the first 18 days of the revolution, around 20 million Egyptians participated in protests in Cairo and Alexandria and, and Suez and other governments in Egypt against calling for freedom and calling for democracy. Uh, what made this phase easier is that there was a huge division between state and institutions, and 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 the army used the revolution to get rid of Mubarak for maintaining the dictatorship and for maintaining the, the privilege which the army had during this regime. Uh, in the 4th of February, uh, it was one week before Mubarak stepping down, I was going to Tahrir Square to participate in, in, uh, in the protest against Mubarak and, and at the time I was arrested by the military intelligence and, and tortured uh, at, at the headquarters of the military intelligence. And that's why when Mubarak stepped down, I knew that the military is not better than Mubarak because I experienced myself their violations. Uh, <coughs> but it happened. The military forced Mubarak on the 11th of February to leave power, and, and they took power. And, and it was a huge propaganda in the media saying that, that the military took power of the people, and they stood bes beside the revolution, and they stood against Mubarak. And, and it was a very huge propaganda for, for me to stand against it. And, and from the first point, they also declared that they, they will maintain the same relation uh, with Israel. And, and they put the silence of inter the international society to their violations by announcing this. Uh, I, I continued my writing, writing uh, uh, about the human rights violations done by the military to me as a person and to other, human, uh, uh, other citizens in Egypt. It contained arbitrary detaining, torturing, killing, uh, and, and even political steps. And I documented each violation by pictures, by videos, by evidences, by human rights uh, uh, reports. Uh, and, and at the time, the military council wanted to silence me. Somehow, they wanted to silence me to be able to continue their propaganda. But at the same time, they wanted to punish me for refusing to serve in the army and for calling for peace in the Middle East and peace with Israel. So in the 28th of, of uh, uh, March 2011, I, was, I got arrested for the fifth time in Egypt. Uh, this time, the military intelligence uh, came to my house and arrested me. Uh, and in the next day, I was uh, uh, tried in front of a military trial, and I was accused with two charges. The first charge was speeding rumors against the military, and the second was uh, uh, trying to insult the military institution. So they said that all the human rights violations I wrote about, even they are documented by pictures and v videos, all of them are fake, and I faked them to spread unknowingly that they, they are fake, untrue, to destroy the reputation of the military. And, and that's one of the around 20 opinions in Egypt which are criminalized by law. So in Egypt, opinion is literally a crime. 20 opinions like criticizing the president, criticizing the military, criticizing the judiciary, criticizing the parliament, criticizing a foreign president like Ahmadinejad or Bashar al-Assad. All these opinions are crimes punishable by three years imprisonment. So they accused me with one of these opinions that I, I insulted the military. Uh, it was a very fast trial. In 12 days, they sentenced me to, to, to three years imprisonment. I didn't have rights. I, I, I wasn't allowed to defend myself, probably. And, and the judge was a military officer. He wasn't an independent uh, uh, judge. In the, same day, in the same day, I was sentenced to three years. This uh, military officer, his name is Ismail Aitman, and he was the chief of the incorporal uh, affairs within the army, which is uh, propaganda. Uh, arm in the army which is supposed to control the public opinion. He uh, was on TV 
And he used my peace activism to call me a traitor and a spy and to link my, my uh, to use my interviews with the Israeli TV or the Israeli media or, or my peace activism as a way to call me a spy. And, and he, he launched a huge propaganda in the media calling me a spy, this questioning my loyalty to my country. And, and, and it was very strange. They never said who I'm spying to. Sometimes it's, it's Israel, sometimes it's the United States, sometimes it's the aliens. Uh, and, and the other side is that they never accused me anything officially about it. So I, all, all the official accusations was about criticizing the military. It wasn't about being a spy. But it's a huge propaganda that pulled on xenophobia and, and, uh, and, and that's what's important. That while the same regime is promoting themselves internationally as, as, uh, as a regime which maintain security and peace in the Middle East, the same regime and the same group of people who are the ones running the anti-peace and the anti-Israel propaganda inside the country. Uh, I was moved into uh, a civilian prison at the time after being sentenced. Uh, I faced unpleasant and unnice conditions with the in inside prison. It was a very hard time and I was even imprisoned with, imprisoned with, with normal criminals uh, and it wasn't a nice experience. Uh, after five months, I, I started to lose hope, and, and I, I couldn't live anymore with the conditions in prison. In prison, especially that the propaganda against me inside the country was huge, and the reaction of the international society was very weak. I, if you imagine the situation, I was in prison, and and United States are giving military aid to, to the Egyptian military, and the international society is, is praising the democratic tr transformation in Egypt and the Egyptian revolution, and saying that Egypt is now living a new era, while I was among over 24,000 civilians arbitrarily detained and military tried through unfair trials. And, and we were just part of a huge amount of, of human rights violations happening by the military council in Egypt. So I decided to protest against this, and I started a hunger strike. Uh, I didn't expect it would be that long, but it lasted for, for 130 days. Uh, my hunger strike affected the international and local society, and a huge campaign started calling for my freedom and calling for, for justice. Uh, Hillel Noir, uh, Amnesty, other, other uh, organizations campaigned for, for, for my release. Uh, Mr. Erwin Kutler, uh, the former uh, Minister of Justice in, in, in Canada, uh, volunteered to become my international attorney. Uh, and, and this huge campaign managed to make more pressure over the military to, to, to release me. Uh, at the time, the military decided or to, to get out of the pressure, they decided to cancel the verdict against me and to retry me again. But they decided that I should be retried or have another trial in front of another military trial. And, and I, boycott, I decided to boycott the trial. I said I'm civilian, I, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't cooperate with any military trial, of course, and also I wouldn't accept to be tried because of my opinions. I wouldn't defend, uh, uh, I wouldn't consider having an opinion a crime and stand defending my right to have an opinion. So at the day of, of the retrial, I refused to move from, from the prison. And before that, I asked my lawyers not, not to uh, show at the court. So the military judge was at the court. I'm not there. My lawyers are not there. He felt uh, 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 as if he's insulted. So he decided to punish me by sending me into a mental hospital. Uh, at, this, at the mental hospital, I found the doctors uh, very angry and they protested against my existence and they even m made a demonstration uh, and this is uh, the picture of, of uh, one of the doctors protesting against uh, my punish punishing me by sending me into a mental hospital and they said we are doctors our mission is to, to help patients not to be used as a tool to punish political prisoners. Uh, because of their courage, uh, the doctor was punished because uh, what she did for me uh, and because of their courage in four days, the military was forced to return me back to prison and to get me out of this mental hospital. Uh, the military was very ashamed and they tried to, to get out of this position, so they offered me a deal if I wrote an apology to the, to the army, they would release me. And, and I refused their, their, their offer and, and my belief was that if, if if I accepted this deal, then what I was fighting for, I was fighting for, for, 
for human rights, for people who made violations to be prosecuted because of their violations, not in the end to be that I am uh, the one who, who had his rights violated to apologize to people who violated my human rights. Uh, so the military continued its trial and I was sentenced to, and they decreased the sentence from three years into two years and, and uh, but because of the, the pressure, the international pressure after, after the second time of sentencing me to prison sentence, I was released last January uh, by a burden by the military council. Uh, to speak more about the, the second phase of, of, of the revolution, which is against the military council, uh, I, I just want to highlight some points. The first point is that from the first day, the military have been working in a coalition with Islamists, uh, which includes the Salafis, which includes the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamic groups. And somehow they made the, the political uh, medium in Egypt hostile towards seculars. So in the same time in which they freed lots of terrorists and allowed them to appear as stars in, in media, in state-owned media, I and my secular friends, we, we were persecuted and jailed. And, and while terrorists were allowed to run in, in election, I couldn't run because I was in prison and my friends couldn't run because even they were persecuted or banned from, from running in, in an election which they promoted by their propaganda that was free and democratic while it wasn't. Uh, during, during the 17 months in which the military council ruled Egypt, they made at least four massacres. One of them was in Maspiro, it was against the Christian protesters, the other was in front of the cabinet, the third one was in, in, in Mohammed Mahmoud Street, and the first one was in Abbasia Square. Over 100 activists, was killed, activists were, were killed during these massacres, and over 10,000 activists were injured. And until now, no one was prosecuted because of these crimes. As I mentioned, I was one out of at least 24,000 civilians tried in front of a military trial, and, and they made this huge amount of trials in less than one year, while Mubarak didn't uh, make this massive violation even in the 30 years he was in power. Uh, the military also spread xenophobia in the media, and, and, and uh, they, they started accusing foreigners for, for uh, accusing them of, of disturbing the security of the country or, tr or, or trying to, to harm the national security of the country. So we have the phenomena of, of arresting Americans and, and some European citizens and accusing them with these fake accusations. Um, uh, and, and also one of the, the, the interesting cases that when they, they made like a social advertisement and they broadcasted it on all national TVs, which it rose each foreigner in the country as a spy who was working for someone who tried to harm Egypt. Uh, part of this xenophobia and, and propaganda was against Israelis. And, and from the beginning of the revolution, they made lots of uh, fake reports in the media about arresting of spies. But in each time, there were no cases, there were no one, just, just fake reports in the media. Until uh, what happened when the, the uh, American Israeli citizen Ilan Grabel was arrested and accused of being a spy, and he stayed in for five months in, 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 in situation which is not nice and in solitary confinement and he even made a hunger strike until he was replaced in a deal. Okay, uh, th we will open the discussion later for questions and you'll be able to express your opinions freely. Thank you. Uh, and, and he was replaced in, in a deal, and while they're speaking a lot about the independence of the judiciary, but obviously it's just for, for the media. Please, please. The one shaming. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is an academic event. We're going to ask for calm. I'm sorry, we're going to wait until you quiet down.
So, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wait until everyone's quiet in order to proceed. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention, we'd like to continue. I'd also like to emphasize as a public institution here, while we are open to all voices, we do have a guest speaker and we would like him to continue with his presentation. There will be questions and answers afterwards, but we expect a little bit of maturity from all our, from all our guests here, not to interrupt our guest speaker. Excuse me. In, in Egypt, we have a saying, uh, which is in Arabic, uh, or, or translated to English, if your voice is high, that means that your evidence is weak. Uh, to continue uh, 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 our subject, uh, after, after 17 months of revolutionaries protesting and using all the nonviolent ways against the military council, uh, the military had to go out of power to get rid of this uh, 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 pressure, local and international pressure. So they made what is they proposed as a, to the world as a free and democratic election, but it was a pseudo-democracy or pseudo-election. It wasn't a serious election. So there were no international and local observation in, on the election, and, and the, the committee which uh, uh, ran the election was somehow biased and prevented some candidates from running. Uh, the, the funds, uh, there were the state institutions were completely biased, so where Islamist streams were allowed to show in the media all the time and, and to use the state-owned media as a tool for promoting themselves at the same time, seculars and, and, and liberals and people who were like me, you, they were accused in the state-owned media as, as traitors and, and infiltrators. Uh, there were no there were only 30 uh, international observers allowed to observe only one day of the voting day of the election, and they were from Carter Institute, and two of them were arrested at the beginning of the election and accused of being spies as a way to intimidate them to, to, to report any violation happening in the election. Uh, according, because of the no transparency in the election process, uh, we are not sure even that they counted the voices or we can take the numbers which was published as, as a serious numbers to represent the Egyptian people. Actually what happened is that the Judiciary com Committee which was responsible uh, for the election, they issued two different results. So in one result they said that Shafi, Ahmed Shafi won the election and he had more voices than Mohamed Morsi and other results saying that Mohamed Morsi won the, the election. So the judiciary tried to be somehow in working in both sides so they didn't announce one of them as a winner and they gave the two documents to the military council and the military council made the deal with, with, with uh, Mohamed Morsi or the Muslim Brotherhood and that's how the Muslim Brotherhood reached power. Uh, as I said, I was released last January, and since uh, that, I, will, I continued my activism. I mentioned that in 2010, I refused uh, to join the army and, and uh, became, at the time, the first conscience objector to the military, in, not only in Egypt, but, but also in Arabic-speaking countries, uh, or, or to make it more accurate, the first known conscience objector, because uh, uh, I'm sure there were people before me, but we don't know their names. Uh, after I got released, my story encouraged two uh, Egyptian activists, and they, these are these pictures. I met the Frawi in the middle and Mohammed Fatih, and they decided to do the same thing. They said, "We are pacifists. We won't carry arms, and we won't serve in, in any military or paramilitary institution. We, we love our country. We are uh, happy to serve in a civil or an alternative service, but we, we are not able to, or, or uh, uh, willing to carry any arms." Um, they are still active in the movement in Egypt. They are living now in, in complete legal status. They can't work, they can't study, they, they can't travel, they can't vote, and they could be arrested at any time. Uh, and, and these are just a model of, of Egyptian and other, other Arabic non, uh, speaker uh, peace activists who we rarely know about while they exist out there. 
uh, uh, one lie spread after uh, Mohammed Morsi or the Islamists took power is that they were against the, the, the military and they took power from the military and that they got uh, uh, rid of the military and, and that was just a play for the, for the media. Uh, and, and just for, for an example, all, all the uh, uh, articles in the Constitution which the military wanted to put to, pre to protect their privileges in the Constitution, the, the Islamists adopted all these articles and put it in the new Constitution. Uh, even even uh, that the chiefs of the military were promoted and given the highest medals of the state, the Nile Medal, which uh, was given to Tantawi and Anand, the biggest or the sen most senior uh, military officers, and, and, and they were promoted, they became advisors of the president himself. Uh, this, this is one of the pictures I drew from inside the prison showing the double face of the Egyptian regime, uh, in which sometimes it, the Egyptian dictatorship appear as, as a religious dictatorship, and sometimes it appear as a military dictatorship, while in fact and in reality they are working together. Uh, one recent uh, event happened after Mor Morsi took power that when uh, a journalist who was affiliated to the Muslim Brotherhood, his name is Gamal Abdurrahim, uh, criticized Tantawi and Danan, the, the uh, senior officers in, in the military council, uh, Morsi interfered personally and, and removed his journalist from his position and, and stated it publicly that it's not permitted to criticize or to insult the senior officers in the army. And, and that's very important to highlight, to know that, that uh, sometimes facts is different than what the regime promotes itself outside as it, as it is. Um, during the last uh, uh, two months, there's a huge phenomenon happening in Egypt that people realize that, that the religious dictatorship is a threat to their freedom and democracy and as led to the aims of the revolution and, and, and the, the, the decisions made by the new president himself to seek more power and, and, and to get control over other institutions in the state provoked the public. And, and because of that, millions of people demonstrated all over Egypt, even small villages in which uh, uh, nobody demonstrated before. At that time, now it's at least 15 million Egyptians have been demonstrated during the last two months against Morsi. Uh, and this is one of the pictures of these recent demonstrations. Uh, during these protests, at least 10 persons were, were killed by the police forces uh, and, and the militias of the Muslim Brotherhood. And, and what is more very important at these uh, uh, protests is that the police wasn't enough to, to oppress these protests. And, and they even, uh, most, Morsi needed to take part or to move his members in the Muslim Brotherhood to try to defend or to oppress the protests and it didn't work. He even needed to get uh, uh, some, some militias from Gaza, from Hamas, to help him fighting Egyptians and oppressing dem demonstrators and it, it didn't work. So it, there is a new phase of the Egyptian revolution happening now in Egypt against religious rule and, and calling for separation between religion and state. And, and, and it's growing all the time. And even they succeeded at one point to, to surround the presidential palace. And this, the middle picture is from the presidential palace in which we were able to, to, to seize the presidential palace. Morsi was, was afraid and has to escape from the palace. We were able to enter, but we refused to make any violence. And, and uh, the whole wall was uh, covered by graffitis and, and, and slogans calling for freedom and democracy. Even, even slogans which even criticize the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood itself. So this picture is, is making fun of Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, calling him Hassan Zibanda. Uh, and the, uh, the lower picture is a picture of the militias, the violent militias used by, by the Muslim Brotherhood to oppress the demonstrations in Egypt. Usually media try to describe it as a clash between two parties, but it is not a clash if, if one side is getting arms and fighting a non-violent side. Uh, just, just for, for, for in, in a rapid way, uh, considering the right situation uh, and considering the situation, the relation between Egypt and Israel, uh, I, I just want to highlight two phenomena or two important points. The first point is that uh, it is very 
different. The, sto the story of Egypt is very different than the story of Israel because while Egyptians is fighting their own dictatorships, it, th their own dictatorship, it's not an exterior external enemy who is oppressing Egyptians, but it's their own citizens fighting them, the Egyptian army and Egyptian extremist groups. That's a different story than Israel because Jews or Israel didn't have their dictatorship before. They haven't fought for, for democracy against their own people before. And, and, and that's, that's a different story when we find uh, uh, strange when when security in Israel sometimes become more important than than sometimes public freedom and sometimes human rights. The other point which which annoys me and annoys other is is the inability to 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 move forward in the peace negotiations with Palestinians, especially after the recognition, the international recognition of Palestine as a state, and and. Uh, uh, when, when someone says that I'm not recognizing the state of Israel, usually my answer is, it exists. You like it or not, it exists. It's not, it's not like if you can close your eye against the sun and say, I can't see the sun. It, it, it will exist, you like it or not. And it's the same <laughs> about the state of Palestine. It has been recognized by the international society and, and not, not uh, recognizing this fact will lead Israel toward more isolation and toward more, more maybe to, to international sanction. I believe that, that we have a start point to start uh, uh, ending the conflict by, by negotiation with the Palestinian Authority and I believe that there is no partner is perfect but it is I believe that the Palestinian Authority is, is good enough to move things forward and, and to fight the, the inflaming powers of the, hit, of the conflict. Uh, that's the last part of my, my speech. It's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, 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 uh, to express what we can do forward to move things uh, uh, forward in the context of the Egyptian-Israeli relation and is in the context of the Israeli-Middle Eastern relations. Uh, I, I, I believe that the first point is to avoid stereotyping. Um, maybe if, if we Egyptians, when they think about Jews, they think about this picture. But if, if, when you see the reality, look at yourself. And, and maybe Jews, when they think about, about Muslims, they think about this picture. But they can see the protesters in Tahrir Square who looks exactly like you. We, we need to get rid of the prejudice and stereotypes which, which stands against our ability to, to trust in each other and, and to live and coexist with each other. Usually when, when uh, people think about society which they don't know, they think that the society is like this. They deal as all Egyptians, all Arabs, while in reality the society is like this. The society is filled with ethnic minority, ethnic groups, religious groups, political groups, and all of them have different colors, have different uh, ideas and different attitudes. We need to get rid of our generalizations. We need to get uh, uh, rid of prejudice and, and start building uh, uh, our beliefs and our ideas based on facts on our own experience. I came here to Israel in order to understand Israel through what I see, through my personal experience. And I believe you have to do the same. You have to travel to Egypt. You have to travel to other Middle Eastern countries and to build your own opinion based on what you saw and what you experienced, not through what you heard from the media, which can be superficial and can be biased. Can I reply in this after finishing my speech? Okay, if, if, I, if I reply to everyone who interrupt me, I wouldn't finish tonight, and you'll have to spend the night with me here. Okay, please, please, please. The, 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 second, the second commandment, the second point, please. The second commandment. Uh, uh, there's usually a mistake we do. Uh, we think, we are taught to think rationally, but we usually accept some lies and then start building facts on these lies rationally. And we believe that we did the right thing by building by a rational way, but we, we, we usually didn't notice that we took the first uh, uh, fact 
unquestioned. And usually academics make this mistake. So we, one, one big mistake is very famous internationally when we speak about Arabic Spring. And we never question ourselves, is these countries are Arabs or not? Because one century ago, Egyptians didn't consider themselves Arabs. Africans are not Arabs. Arab Arabia or Arabs were referred to a, to a place in the world which is used now as Saudi Arabia. And when the Saudi family reached power, they changed the name from Arabia to Saudi Arabia. And even it's Egypt itself, it attended international conferences in the beginning of the 20th century as a non-Arabic state. So this phenomena of Arabic nationalism, it just rose with, with, with nationalism, which rose internationally in the last century, and, and accepting to deal with all these people living in this part of the world as Arab, it's a mistake of itself. And, and, and it's the same about some simple inaccurate fact saying that Egyptians are all of them are religious or, or, or conservatives or traditional. And, and usually we accept th these, these uh, uh, facts unquestioned or these uh, information unquestioned. And we start to, to build rationally on them. OK, if they are religious, then that means that they elected the Muslim Brotherhood. So we are thinking rationally, but building on, on a lie. It's, it's the same point that we can't peace, build peace on, on dictatorship or, or, or on lie. Uh, two important uh, uh, incidents happened in history. The first incident happened when, when Egypt has a secret peace or a secret agreement with Gamal Abdel Nasser since 1956 until 1967. It was an agreement between uh, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser's dictator and Israel. And according to this deal, Israel uh, uh, had access to its right to, to sail freely through the Red Sea. Uh, but Gamal Abdel Nasser, because he was a dictator, he hid this information from the Egyptians. And, and it lasted 11 years of deception, where my people were deceived and they didn't have access to this information. In, in 1967, when, when El Bas, the Syrian El Bas, uh, uh, mentioned this information, Egyptians were shocked and they felt betrayed and deceived. And that's how this secret agreement fall in less than three weeks. So even, even if you can have a secret deal, which lasted for, for 11 years, it can collapse at three months if this deal wasn't built on transparency and, 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 and openness. The same thing about, about why the question why uh, uh, the Egyptian dictatorship haven't stopped the anti-Israel propaganda in the state-owned media and in the state-run uh, uh, education uh, even after 30 years from the peace treaty. And that's why we need to understand that dictatorships are living on the basis of having an enemy. Every dictatorship needs an enemy. And, and, that's, and that's why they need to create an enemy. It can be China, it can be uh, Algeria, as, as what happened before, and, and it can be Israel. And that's why it's very important to link between peace and democracy. We can't have peace without democracy, and we can't have democracy without peace, because as long as a dictatorship exists, they will ha need an enemy, and, and you can be used as an enemy to oppress freedom. And that's the fact in Egypt when, when uh, as I mentioned, around two million recruits are obligated to serve in the army under the name of protecting Egypt from, from Israel. So the security issue is used in dictatorship to limit freedoms. And, and we, I believe that, that we must acknowledge and understand that peace and democracy and development, the three of them are linked together and supporting a dictatorship is, is basically or simply supporting an anti-peace entity. Uh, the, third, the third point we need to understand that that peace happened in a mutation way and, and evolution way, not a big bang. If, if a simple scientific understanding, a big bang happened only one time in history. Evolution happens every day. Big bang happened in physics. Evolution happens with, with living beings. Peace is not as if Sadat and Begin will sit with each other and solve our problems. Peace is not that Abbas and, and Netanyahu or whoever sit with each other and fix everything. No, peace doesn't work in this way. Peace and reconciliation is a process. It can take decades. It can take centuries. And, and the example of the, the, the Irish-British conflict and the Irish terrorism, it took over a century of, of reconciliation process to be able to somehow for the Irish and for the British to coexist together without violence. So, 
some some people say, okay, we have peace with, with Egypt for for 30 years now, and it's not working, and we still uh, doesn't feel feel trust about each others, and and the military is not feeling trust about each others, uh, and and somehow we we are pushing things as if we are imagining it can be solved at one deal, at one treaty. And, and it doesn't work that way. It, it's a process, it can take decades or centuries. And, and to get back in time, Sadat and Begin themselves, they understood it's not one treaty, it's not a big bang, it's not one time. So they, they made first Camp David agreement, then a few months later they made the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, and then they continued negotiations. They were negotiated, uh, negotiating about other things. So. If, if we are looking about peace with, between Israel and any other Middle Eastern countries, we have to understand it's a process which will take years, decades, maybe centuries. And, and that's how it happens with human beings. That's life. <clears throat> and this, the, far, the fourth point, um, I chose these two pictures to show you how Egyptians imagine their dictators. So in the first picture is Mubarak and the second is Morsi. And both of them were drawn as, as Hitler, as Nazis, not as Jews. And usually the, the media try to draw Egyptians as, these are, I didn't make these pictures, they, they were taken enormously from protests in Egypt. Usually media try to draw Egyptians as, as anti-Israel or anti-Semitic population. But when you see it in reality, when, when, when uh, uh, you see how people, and maybe very simple people, express themselves for local, not that wasn't made for, for international promotion, it was meant in small protests, they saw their, their dictators as, as, as they saw the Nazis. Uh, and and I, I chose this, this, these uh, pictures to show that we need to reevaluate to know who's our friend and who's our enemy. Because Mubarak, who was named several times as a friend of Israel, he is the one who's running the anti-Israel propaganda. He's the one in his education system didn't put Israel on maps and put only Palestine. And he's the one who used the state-owned media to, to, to uh, spread xenophobia and, 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 uh, uh, and anti-Semitism. And, and the normal Egyptians have seen Mubarak as a Nazi. We have we need every time to reevaluate our friends and to understand who exactly is our enemy. <laughs> the fifth point, the fifth point, the fifth point, we need to look at the picture from a holistic point of view. I don't know why we can't react as human beings living in the 21st century. ביטחון, איש ביטחון אפשר להוציא אותו כבר?
Excuse me, excuse me, this is... Ma'am, if you think this is how you're gonna get respect for your cause, you're poorly mistaken. Please leave. Excuse me, excuse me, ma'am. Sir, could you please sit down? Please sit down. Excuse me, ma'am. You're going to need to sit back. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to continue our event, please. Could you please sit down? Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to continue. But again, I'd like to request that in the Institute of Higher Education, to understand what respect means and to hear diversity of points, points diversity goes, respect, excuse me, goes both ways. So just as we've respected Mr. Nabil in his perspective, if you would like to voice your point. For those who would like, Mr. Nabil is up for it afterwards, so he'll be happy to take questions. But again, respect goes both ways. If you would like to have your voice heard, your opinion heard, you need to hear our guest speaker. You came as a guest to this event, to our university. We expect you to treat yourself and each other and our guests as such. Uh, I think what happened now uh, it shows us how peace activists are not uh, uh, loved in both sides. So while in, one, in my country I'm called a spy and a traitor and, and, and even from the other side, uh, uh, it's not that welcoming environment. Uh, <coughs> I, move, I move to the next point. When, when someone suffers, usually he focus only about his suffering. And, and he only see his part of the picture. And, and if we wanted to solve any situation, we have to go outside of our situation and try to see the whole picture. This, this picture try to, to explain this, this situation, in which, in which we see a situation with double sides. And if someone took one part of the situation, he can make himself a victim. And if someone I need to finish today. <laughs> okay, what I was saying is that 
for when we see only one part of the picture, we usually see a misleading picture, even drawing someone as a complete victim or drawing someone as a complete uh, 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 evil person. When, when we try to understand the conflict, any conflict on this planet, we, are, we must understand that there is no angels and no demons. There is no black and white. And usually things are in the gray area. We need, even, even, even understanding the Israeli, Palestinian, or any conflict in the Middle East, we have to understand that each conflict, conflict have, have other aspects and maybe rules, which, can, may, which may be apolitical at all. Uh, Ali Salem, who visited the Egyptian peace activist who, and writer, he visited Israel uh, lots of times. In, in his book about, uh, under the name A Trip to Israel, he, he mentioned that the whole conflict is not about, about anti-Semitism or, or, that's his view, uh, it's not about anti-Semitism or, or a political conflict. He said that the conflict is economic. He was a, he's a socialist, so he had a socialist uh, uh, vision to life. And he said that the huge difference in the, difference in the economic status between Israel and its neighbors is a the, is the serious point in the conflict. Uh, I, I'm not saying that I completely agree with this, with this part, with this vision, but we, we need to understand the whole picture of the conflict from the economic and social and cultural and historic aspects of the conflict. It's not about a piece of occupied territory. It, it, it has lots of aspects which can be more deep than this, and, and we need to, to, to solve these deep problems to be able to solve the conflicts. Other, other point related to the holistic point of view is, is it is not that if only Israel in Middle East which is facing uh, hostility. Uh, so if, if we notice what happened with the South Sudanese people, with Africans in, in Darfur, even who were Muslims, the Nubians who were deported from their lands in, in Sudan and, and, and Egypt, the Amazigh, and, uh, Amazigh in North Africa and the unrecognition to their culture and identity by, by Arabic nationalists, the Kurdish and their suffering, the, the discrimination against Baha'is and, and Christians in, in, in Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, uh, not Syria, uh, Saudi Arabia and other countries. We, we recognize that it's, it's not only that there is some dictators like Abbas trying to, 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 to throw Israel in the sea. We have a problem in Middle East and North African countries, which is racism, and racism against whoever different, even, even he speaks about a different language, in a different language, or he believes in a different belief. And, and, and we must understand that solving the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or enhancing the Israeli-Egyptian relations means that we have to solve the biggest problem, which is racism in the Middle East, and we must understand that, that the destiny, which is Kurdish people facing in Iran, in Iraq, or, or the destiny in which Africans are facing uh, uh, in, in Sudan, it's the same destiny uh, which Israel is going through. If, if Middle Eastern are tolerant to, to, to Kurdish and to African and to Amazigh, that means that they will be tolerant to, to Israel. If, if there is a racism in, in, in Middle East and people are racist toward, toward Kurdish or, or other minorities, that means that, that they will also hate who is differ, different than them, like Israel. Um, okay, that's a very important point. Uh, we have a problem now in recent uh, policy in, in whole Middle Eastern countries, including Israel, that most of our politicians, or maybe 100% of our politicians, they plan for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. We don't have a single government in Middle East planning for 20 years forward or 30 years forward. We, we care about who's now in power in Egypt and who is now in power in Israel, but we don't care about who will be in power in Egypt after 10 years? Who will be in power in, in Israel after 10 years? Who will be in power in Turkey after 10 years? And, and, and it, it, as an example, if you realize that how the Zionist movement started and how they didn't plan for, for one day or two days forward, they planned for, for 50 years forward, for 60 years forward, and maybe for a century. If you want to, to achieve uh, any success in any field, I believe we need to have long-term policies, and we should understand that planning for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow is just delaying problems. We have to, to plan for, for, for a long-term policies and think about the leaders of 2030, 2030 and the, the, the future. 
uh, and the future leaders of other Middle Eastern countries which can affect uh, uh, our policy making. Okay, I have to skip because of the, of the time. Uh, that's the point. Um, and we usually make this mistake when we sh play a shift, uh, play, um, shift game shift, uh, play shift game, trying to play on the other side. In Egypt, we have a, a, a saying saying, uh, it says simply that if you are in a dark place and you just start speaking against darkness, it wouldn't be ever turn it to light. But the only way to fight darkness is by uh, uh, lighting, a, uh, lighting a candle or, or starting to open light. If, if, if we are want to fight racism or, or hatred or, or, uh, or uh, push for, toward peace or reconciliation, we need, we need to, to, to stop blaming the other side and try building something. And that's nearly simple to the, similar to the situation happened here. I'm trying to do something. I'm not claiming that I'm perfect. I'm not claiming that you are perfect. I'm not claiming that anyone perfect. But it is usually this, that there are two groups of people. There's a group of people who's just blaming the other side, whoever was the other side. They are the bad ones and we are the good ones. And there is other group of people who are trying to do something and acknowledging that they are not angels and the others are not devils and, and we need to do something to make it better for ourselves and for the next generations. Uh, I will finish with this. Uh, this was one of the drawings I drew uh, in, inside prison, and, and I mixed it between the ancient Egyptian flag and the Israeli flag, the ancient key of life, which was part of the Egyptian, uh, uh, ancient Egyptian civilization, uh, and, and the symbol of peace. Uh, we must believe that we can make a change, uh, and, and we can look at lots, lots of models in, in history. When Martin Luther King uh, uh, acted for, for equality between black and white people in the United States, he said, I have a dream. He knew that he's just dreaming. It wasn't, in, in his reality, he couldn't visualize it, that people are, are treated as equal. And he said, I have a dream. He acknowledged that this is a dream. But his dream became a reality. We must understand that, that we can make things happen and, and everything Nothing is impossible and everything can be achieved if we put the enough force and power to do it. Uh, thank you a lot for, for, for listening to me and... Thank you, Michael, for your insights, your own personal stories, and your vision for the future. Um, if you're up to it, we can uh, open up for a few questions. Um, before we open it up for a few questions uh, for Mr. Nabil, I'd like to ask um, for those who are called upon to ask a question to uh, not only state your name, but to keep it to actually ask a question. This is not a point uh, to give a lecture to our guest speaker. It's a academic institution, we expect you to be uh, asking questions and getting insight for your own, making your own decisions. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes, if you could stand and just, in your call, to just please stand, say your name and your question. We'll repeat the question. It's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Could you please stand? I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Okay, uh, first, uh, 
I come from a Christian background. I'm not a believer myself, but my family are Christians. Uh, and there are lots of Christians among among democratic movements, uh, among politic. No, not not more than because the Christians in the country is like 10% of the population, so they are not they are minority. Uh, so of course they will the, their numbers would be less than than activists who are from a Muslim background or or even non-believers. Uh, maybe during Mubarak time and and even the military council uh, rule. Uh, some Christians were somehow scared from from the the Muslim Brotherhood reaching power, and somehow they tried. Somehow they were asking themselves, or or in a situation, some of them support the dictatorship for fear of having the Muslim Brotherhood in power, and and some of them believed in democracy, uh, and and fought for democracy and freedom, knowing that the existence of the dictatorship just. Uh, uh, increase poverty and increase racism, and these are the the, the major uh, uh, feelings which support Islamism and extremism. Uh, that 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 debate ended after Muslim Brotherhood took power, and and this debate is not not in question anymore because Islamists are already in power, and 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 if if we didn't stop them as fast as possible. Uh, there would be more violations to human rights toward minorities and, of course, toward Christians. Sectarian issues haven't been stopped uh, uh, in Egypt since the dictatorship was established in 1952. So for the last six years in which the dictatorship has existed in Egypt, violations to minorities have, have been sponsored by the state. Uh, it, it is not only about, about Jews who were expelled in Egypt, so around 80,000 uh, Jews were expelled in Egypt from Egypt from 1950 until 1956, and, and their properties were robbed and their national citizenship was dropped by the state. Uh, the Shia and, and the Baha'i minorities was delegalized in the country and were not allowed to practice the religion, and, and sectarian incidents happened toward Christians all the, all of the time. So that's how I understand it, and I think most of, of the Christian minority now understand it in the country that the dictatorship and racism is is, is linked together as much as, as peace and democracy and development are linked together. Also, dictatorship and dictatorships and racism uh, and hatred are linked together, and and that's why we are we are working now together in Egypt. Uh, uh, whatever was our religious beliefs for democracy and 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 for development and for peace. I just want to acknowledge the presence of Erwin Kotler. Professor Erwin Kotler, Canada's former Minister of Justice, member of Canadian Parliament. <laughs> who is uh, an internationally renowned human rights advocate, who was Michael's international lawyer, and I had the privilege of being his student at McGill University Law School. McGill University Law School. So uh, we thank Professor Kotler for everything he's done for, for Michael's release and for helping get mes Michael's message of peace out to the world. Okay. Uh, I I okay. She asked about about. Uh, I mentioned in my articles and my articles that the obligatory military service is a kind of slavery, and and she asked if this applies only to the Egyptian military or to other armies, uh, and she asked me about what I say to Israelis about this. Um, first, the 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 most primitive understanding of the state which was based on, on the rule of, of no taxation without presentation. The state as, as an entity was established because we don't want to do the public issues, so we bring a group of people, we, we elect a group of people, and we pay them taxes to do the work for us. So the taxation system was based mainly on having people doing our job instead of us. So when we have a state and we pay taxes for the state and then the state asks us to do the same work of the state, that means that we are paying double. And, and, and when the state or any private entity makes someone work without a salary, that became slavery. 
because the difference between a worker and a slave is that the slave work without without a salary or without an income, and the slave the, the slave work and the, the the worker work for a salary. So. From, from this point of view, any obligatory military service which result in, in not paying salaries for recruits is, is a part of slavery. Uh, I acknowledge that, that somehow the obligatory military service have been uh, uh, recognized internationally by lots of countries. But even through the international laws and human uh, rights uh, laws, there is, there is uh, uh, first that the state must recognize the right of conscientious objection to the military service. So even by international law, if a state forces its citizen for, for the case of war or emergency to serve in the army, the state must respect their freedom of belief and freedom of religion. And if their belief or religion contradict with, with carrying arms or fighting or killing, the state doesn't have the right to force its citizens to carry arms. And, 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 and we, we faced lots of cases in which Israeli citizens who, who believed in pacifism and, and they were in prison because of their beliefs which contradicted with, with the laws of the state. And, and I'm against this and, and I, I campaign lots of times for political prisoners or, or prisoners uh, who, refused, who were in prison because of refusing the military service not only in Egypt or, or, or Israel, but also in, in, in several countries around the world and Turkey. Uh, and I will continue to do this because I believe that the state doesn't have the right to force its citizens to do things they don't want to do. And our lives, we own our lives. The state doesn't have the right to tell me what to work or what to do. If, I, if someone chooses to go to the military, that's his decision, and I respect his decision. But but the state doesn't have the right to force, any state doesn't have the right to force any citizen to do something he doesn't want to. Uh, okay, and when we deal with dictatorships, when we deal with each, any country, whatever it was, we have to recognize or differentiate between the actions of the state and the actions of the people. And, and, and in dictatorships, this gap increases. Uh, I believe that xenophobia in Egypt is, is sponsored by the state. And, and Egypt has had lots of diversities before the military coup. So we had huge uh, uh, Armenian and Greek population in Egypt. And when, when Armenians faced the genocide in Turkey in, nine, in, 19, uh, in the first part of the 20th century, they came to Egypt because Egypt was, was a, a very uh, uh, tolerant society at that time. And when Abdullah al Qusimi, the Saudi uh, Wahhabi scholar, uh, converted from, from Islam to atheism, he came to Egypt and, and stayed his life in Egypt because uh, Egypt was very tolerant at the time. And, and Jews lived in Egypt during the liberal democracy phase in Egypt until the military coup without troubles. And even when some members in the Muslim Brotherhood at the time, in, in the 40s, made, made some terrorist attacks against the Jewish properties, they was, were persecuted by the state uh, judiciary and, and none of them ran out of punishment. What happened that when the military coup happened in 1952, that they started adopting this xenophobia and, uh, and uh, agenda. And, and to understand why they did that, they needed to cut the, the relations and the contacts between Egyptians and foreigners. So in the first 20 years after the military coup during Gamal Abdel Nasser time, for even Egyptians to travel out of Egypt, they needed a, a permission from the president himself. And, and, and that's, that's maybe another understanding why there is a hostility in Middle East toward Israel, because dictatorship simply doesn't want uh, uh, their people and their citizens to see somehow a democratic model and try to copy it to the, their country. That's why xenophobia is very important for any dictatorship. In North Korea, in, 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 in Cuba, in, in Egypt, or any other dictatorship, it's very important to, to, to control your citizens and to make them not to go in contact with any uh, uh, citizens of a democratic country to prevent them from trying to copy this, this model. But in, in practice, 
I, I believe there is, there is some damage happened to the society, but I believe it is not, uh, uh, I believe that the majority of Egyptians are turned toward, toward foreigners. Uh, until, until the revolution, there were over, over nearly half a million Israelis coming to Sinai each year, and, and most of them, or, or nearly few, few people of them had troubles. And, and, and until now, Europeans and Americans, and even some Israelis travel to Egypt without, without troubles. Uh, what I believe in is that the majority of the society are not xenophobic, they are not racist, there are a huge uh, racist propaganda that comes from the regime and from uh, extremist Islamic groups and, and with the fund, which is uh, the amount of resources and funds which both of them have, uh, it, it's hard to fight their propaganda. And that's what I myself and my fellow liber liberals are doing in Egypt, fighting this racist propaganda, which affects also uh, citizens of my country who, who are not in the majority. Uh, that's how I see the situation. Um, yeah. Okay, I don't, I don't believe that I have a, a special story. Uh, Usually dictatorships close the society. So they somehow dictatorships try to control the ideas in the marketplace inside the society. So they control the education system and they control the media and through these tools they can control what people think in. Uh, what happened during the last 10 years that we have something which opened the society which is the internet <laughs> and, and, and satellite TV. And, and both of them, they opened the society so it was possible for the first time in, in history that people can have access to resources which the state doesn't want them to see it. And we have access to information which the state doesn't want us to, need, to know. So it's not my personal story, it's, it's the story of all my generation, which, which for surprise and, and without, without meaning that the state, uh, uh, for, for economic reasons, allowed the, the, the inter freedom to internet. And through the internet, I was able to express my opinion, I was able to contact with other people, to exchange uh, uh, points of view as other people. That's why how I made uh, uh, friendship with lots of people from, from Europe, from America, from Latin America, and from Israel. The internet gave us this tool to have the access to information through individuals, through communication with individuals, or through access to information. And, and that's why dictatorships hate internet. That's why North Korea, Iran, China limit the internet freedom. And that's why internet is, I believe that internet is a human rights because internet gives you the, the access to the information which even your government doesn't want you to have access to it. Uh, we're going to take two more questions. Uh, in the back, in blue. Okay. Uh, if, if you read my, my, my articles about before coming here to Israel, you will find that I had a very high expectations and very positive uh, uh, vision about Israel. And, and that, that's part of the problem that uh, media doesn't mirror things as, as, as they look during, uh, as facts or reality. Uh, what was shocking for me is how the religious in influence in Jerusalem and, and the lack of public transportation during the Shabbat, uh, the <laughs> uh, yes, uh, uh, for the Shabbat I had I had very uh, hard time finding transportations and 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 so somehow I'm fighting uh, uh, religious influence in the state in my country and 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 in Egypt we don't have a civil marriage and and I've been working against this for a long time and it's it's sad to find true stories in Israel of people who had to travel outside of Israel because they didn't couldn't get ma married to, to is inside Israel so I think in in whole Middle East in your country and my country we need to make more effort for for achieving more secularism more separation between the state and and the religion and and it's a challenge for for both of our societies but we have to face it because it's part of the reconciliation process as long as everyone is raising his 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 nationalism and raising his his uh, religious uh, beliefs and we don't look as, at each other as, as human beings but we look at each other as Arabs and Jews uh, or, or, uh, um, or Zionists or, or Arabic nationalists or, or, or Muslims and Christians as long as we look 
catch each other through the, the eyes or glasses was, was of ideologies, it would be hard for us to coexist together. We have to look at each other as human beings and let the ethnic background and the religious views as a personal thing between the person and himself or his gut. One more question. Okay, Egypt as, as, as each society, there is some secular small groups, and on the other side there are some extremist Islamic groups, which include the, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the majority of the society is a kind of swing voters. They vote according to their interest. I think the majority of society a kind of traditional moderate uh, 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 views, and, and some of them supported the Muslim Brotherhood in the last election because it was choose between the military dictatorship or the Muslim Brotherhood. So somehow the, 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 the process made them choose the less evil thing. Uh, but I believe that during the last six months when the Muslim Brotherhood failed economically uh, and, and through the economic crisis they are leading the country to and through the huge amount of taxation they are forcing on the country. And, and because of the oppression of freedom, because of people who were killed in protests and because of people who were tortured and killed in some police stations, because of the people got arrested for blasphemy or, or for criticizing the president, I think the bad policies which was uh, applied by the Muslim Brotherhood in the last six months, they managed to make to lose these swing voters and to move them to the other side, to the secular side. And that's why we have over 15 million Egyptians participate in protests during the last two months against the Muslim Brotherhood and killing, k calling for, for complete separation between the state and religion and, and, and uh, calling for professionalism, calling that people who, who studied religion uh, uh, shouldn't be supposed or allowed to take decisions in economy and politics. They should be, uh, uh, everyone should work in his uh, field of, of professionalism. And, and that is that's how I believe the majority believe in Egypt. That doesn't mean that they are pro atheism or they are anti-religious, but they, they, I think, through, through the personal experiences which my people passed through during the last year, they understood that, that we need to make a separation between religion and state. I know there's lots of other questions, but it's been a long day, and we want to, uh, first off, thank Michael Nabil for coming to the university. Thank you. Thank you again to everyone who helped put this event together. Hillel and Masha from UN Watch, all our staff here at the International Programming, Conflict Resolution Mediation, and the International MA in Middle Eastern Studies. I just want to say that um, personally, um, to thank you again for your courage in coming here and speaking to us. And as much as I personally and professionally don't feel it's appropriate to apologize on other people's behalf on their actions, I do feel as we welcomed you into our home here at the university to apologize for those who couldn't respect this setting and this institution, so I apologize on their behalf. I really um, hope in us and uh, our students who are sitting in the front of the room teaching conflict resolution and mediation, that includes when talking about issues such as divisive as this and such as controversial, that we're still able to look at each other in the eye and respect each other's viewpoints in the future. And I thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the audience who came tonight and respected that and respected our guests and respected each other. Um, Please be in touch with us on our uh, page on the uh, website on the internet, as well as on Facebook for upcoming events, um, as we have a wide variety of speakers coming from around the world, um, such as Mr. Nabil, and hope to see you in, again in the future for a future event. Have a good night. Thank you.